It's October. We're into small game hunting season in Pennsylvania. I've got my orange on, <laughs> but Penn State has big game this week and the next several weeks coming up. So, guys, before they kicked off with the Buckeyes, they're ranked ninth in the country. They lose the game and then take a week off. They're now number eight. Talk about falling forward. Hey, it's like the U.S. Open. It's great to be in the clubhouse. Okay. <laughs> By the way, did Jeremy Pruitt send you those pants? All right. Uh, the blue-white tailgate is next. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the Blue White Tailgate. Steve, Jay, Todd, Josh coming up in just a few moments. <laughs> Enjoy it. This is okay. my gift to you. All right, all of you. 2004 World Series. I, I go to game two, okay? And Larry Walker is playing right field for the Cardinals. So we're like five rows off the field next to the pesky pole. And this guy, and, and that didn't swear once the whole night, but this guy at the end of the row is, is heckling Walker the entire game. Of course, the Cardinals wear the red shoes. He looks out in the eighth and he goes, Walker. Turn the shoes off. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Jay. <laughs> Turn you the gotta have these when you go out in the woods. And I'm out in the woods a lot, so you better have some orange. They got some volume to them. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, a bye week. Uh, all right. So what do, you, what do you think of the bye week? Well, I think Jay went into the closet during the bye week <laughs> and, and grabbed some stuff. But, hey, look, you know, the bye week's great to get healthy. Uh, some people say, well, you get a loss like that, you want to get back out on the field. I, I think it's fine. They took the week off. They regrouped a little bit. They did some self-scouting, and they're ready to go. Now they, they look, not seven weeks in a row. This is going to decide their season, right? Now this, this yeah. stretch here. If you win, it was awesome. Yeah. If you lose, sure. it was, oh, we shouldn't have it. So, I mean, you know, we'll know Saturday night whether the bye week was good or bad. Well, we'll find out. And for James Franklin and the Nittany Lions, when they look over at what they need to do down the stretch, he's looking for another 1%. Number one, you know, we're at a point in our, in our program, we, we got to fight for every little gain we possibly can find. And, and it's not going to be in one specific area. Can we improve 1% nutrition? Can we improve 1% in sleep? Can we improve 1% in scheme? Can we improve 1% in terms of practice, effort, and focus in meetings, in taking notes, and all those types of things? Uh, because that's really where we're at. And for decades, Jay, we heard over and over again, take care of the little things, the big things will take care of themselves. And that's what they're talking about. No question, but that's not something that you should come, to, that's not something you should realize five weeks in season. Not that they are, but that's something that's got to be an everyday thing. And right. when you look at a, a program like Alabama, that's an everyday thing. Ohio State's an everyday thing. And Penn State, it's always been an everyday thing. Yeah, you know, but he's talked about this for two years, though. So this is not, you know, this he's been trying to emphasize this for two years. All right, so now let's get to the PSECU pregame update. There's only one person capable of doing that. That's Josh Sperber. Welcome back to the Update Desk, sponsored by PSECU. A big question coming into this week was K.J. Hamler's status after he was knocked out in the third quarter of the Ohio State game on a targeting penalty on Isaiah Pryor. When asked about his status for this week's contest, James Franklin simply replied, Yeah. So you should definitely expect to see Hamler in the game on Saturday. As for next week, we have a road contest for Penn State against Indiana. The game time for that is set at 3.30. But we're going to focus on this week against the Spartans. Steve, back to you. All right, Josh. They are playing for the most important <laughs> trophy in sports. <laughs> The Land Grant Trophy. It's a lightweight thing, too, yeah. right? It takes four small, managers petite, to carry small it. Small and petite is what yeah. we Brad, as Brad right. Caldwell, our equipment guy, used yeah. to say, if oh. we win, they get it. Yeah. <laughs> and, that's, and, and he <laughs> was the first it. to coin right. that term, yeah. and everybody's in Winner's right. choice. Yeah. <laughs> but it does, it, does, it does collect a lot of dust. And by the way, let's take a look at the numbers in this series. This has turned out to be a really good series over the years. And you can see how it's played out between the two. At one point, it was the last game of the regular season. And now it's moved all over the place like everything else. But, again, uh, let's get to Juwan Johnson because, look, uh, the players are not going to look back at what happened last year. We know what happened last year, uh, but we just have to, like I said, we have to be better than what we were yesterday and be better than what we were last year. So 
But when we hit, one thing we have to do is focus on our details, focus on uh, what we have, and uh, commit to our standard. And that's the one thing we have to do to uh, win this game. Yeah, I know, Todd, I don't want to relive last year. <laughs> I don't know if anybody wants to relive last year. That was a long afternoon for everybody involved in that particular game. And yeah, that's been an interesting series the last three years. You know, a couple yeah. of blowouts and then last year's weird game with the weather delay. Yeah. And this one's going to be interesting, too. And, you know, there's no hangover concerns, at least I have, about Ohio State. No. You just have specific concerns, right, about what Michigan State yeah. can bring to the table. We'll yeah. talk about those some more. Yeah, we are, including how they do against the run defensively. They're number one in the nation. Coming up, we'll take a look at that Penn State offense that will match up with Michigan State as we continue after this. Welcome back. All right, let's take a look at some numbers. We like looking at numbers. Yeah, All right, absolutely. so let's look at some of the hidden numbers, some of the hidden gems. Todd was up researching all week. Todd, this is what you came up with. Uh, yeah, they're perfect in the red zone, aren't they? First, first downs, second, and pass efficiency, which, of course, Jay mentioned is a little askew because Sean Clifford's numbers are so yeah. good. But Oh, uh, they're ridiculous. Hey, He's like 400 and something points. <laughs> Yeah, but, I mean, here, but here's the key in the first number, the red zone number. It's yeah. 22 touchdowns. That's exactly hey, That's right. finishing drives. So you, if you go inside the number, that becomes a you know, 100% that's the, that's great. That's even better number. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's the better number. So 22 touchdowns. Inside the hidden number, even farther, what's hiding in there is what you found with the touchdowns. Right. That's good, yeah. Steve. Because and, I and knew you researched this so much. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Right. And I Trace's wonder, numbers would be even better right. except for some drops. Yeah. And that's the other area. That number could be, could be even higher. Yeah. With more consistently catching the football. It's kind of one of those help me help you moments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what it all results in is the offense has been pretty darn yeah, good. It has no been really good. And let's, so let's get into Ricky Ronnie. Uh, Juwan Johnson likes the job that he's been doing, likes the way the offense has been moving along, moving forward. He's done a great job. You know, he's calling uh, the plays with confidence. He's given us confidence by uh, giving us opportunities. And uh, the one thing he's doing is just uh, – you know, giving uh, everybody an opportunity, uh, giving Trace that opportunity to make plays. Uh, even Tommy got some times, uh, you know, do what he can do with the ball. And uh, just uh, pretty much spreading the ball around, let us, uh, letting us work. Jay, what does it take as a play caller to find a rhythm with what you're doing based on the personnel you have? Well, you know, when you have new, some new personnel, which Penn State did, you have to know who you can trust. You know, who's going to make the play, who's going to make the catch for you. And despite the fact that they've had some troubles catching the football, they have found – you know, Firemuth made some plays for him yeah. now. Uh, Hamler's obviously made a lot of plays for him. Uh, you know, I think the next challenge will be can Sanders get involved in the passing game, which we'll talk about in the film room, how that helped him. But I think he's done a nice job getting the ball moving around. Quite a, quite a great And, really you know, the, inter job. the interesting thing about play calling, too, is, you know, you design the play to work, right? So after a chunk yeah. play, sometimes they've had a play that absorbs a loss. That's not what it's designed to do, obviously. Right. And Coach Franklin was talking about that at his press conference earlier in the week, how – Look, you call the play for a reason, and if it doesn't get executed, there's a number of reasons why it didn't get executed. But that has been something that has happened to Penn State, is they've had a chunk play followed by something they think is going to work, and it didn't work. It get derails the drive or maybe puts you in a bad situation. All right, so let's get to our Blaze Alexander players to watch down the stretch, brought to you by our good friends at Blaze Alexander Family Dealerships. All right, so let's go around the room. We'll start with the camera people. No, uh, let's go around the room. Todd? <laughs> Player, you know, mentioned offense. it, Fryermuth. He gets yeah. his start. He yeah. earned the starting spot. A true freshman tight end. He's in there. Man, he is a smooth receiver uh, against a team like Michigan State this week that has a really stout rushing defense. He's really going to be can be an important player and a valuable player. So I look for him now that he's earned that starting spot to really step up in the second half. Well, I'm going to stay right on that vein with you and talk about Juwan Johnson because with Hamler's success right now, if you're getting ready to scheme Penn State, you're going to take him. Do what you can to take Hamler out of the game. And, and you can do that to an extent. He's as good as he is. Juwan Johnson and Fryer Muth, the two guys, are going to have to take the pressure off of uh, Hamler and make people respect the outside receivers. And you know what those two have in common? Size. Yep. Right? Penn State does. Polk, Tompkins, obviously, and Hamler, okay, great, really good players. But on the smaller side, bigger targets can help you in certain situations where you're talking about. The guy I'm going to go with Miles Sanders. Right? You want to be able to balance your offense out. And it takes a lot of pressure off Trace McSorley if Sanders and that offensive line are working in conjunction. You saw the Illinois game, what that meant. So that would be the guy I would go with. All right, tail of the tape. Here we go. 
right? Far more legitimate than any boxing match we've seen lately. Uh, you can see the numbers. The big part is the 33.8 yards per game given up rushing by Michigan State. Now, they haven't played what you'd call the murderer's row of rushing teams, but that is incredible no matter what you do with it. I mean, well, it's, it's not only 33 yards. It's 1.3 yards yeah. per attempt, and this is not a team that's gotten a lot of sacks. A lot of times those rushing numbers are skewed by teams that have 15, 20 sacks in five games, and all of a sudden there's 80 yards up. They're, they're, they're really good against The 1.3 shows you they're not being pushed back and at the point of contact either. That's you know, usually right. a running back will hit the line and then maybe fall forward or get another half yard or two yards. Uh, that's 1.3 is impressive, and a lot of that is a lot of tackles for losses. But they've, then again, they're also giving up over 300 yards a game passing-wise. Yeah. And uh, Josh Sperber, Josh, that means the uh, pass game for Penn State will have to step up in a game like this against that Michigan State offense. Penn State's passing attack could be key against the Michigan State team that has allowed touchdowns from 20 or more yards out in each of their past four games, including three against the Wildcats this past weekend. Coincidentally, in last year's loss against the Spartans, Penn State scored all three of their touchdowns from 27 yards out or more. And they certainly have the playmakers to continue that trend this season. We have a lot of players that get the ball. You know, we have a lot of people at running back position, a lot of people at wide receiver. You know, we got Tommy that sprinkled in there. You know, we have Pat uh, Bowers and uh, Jonathan Holland uh, that's also at tight end. So we have a lot of people who can be sprinkled in to, to make plays. I'm just saying yeah, we have a lot of depth on our uh, offense so we can make those plays. There is a lot of depth on this Penn State offense, but drops have been an issue all season long. So far this year, Penn State has recorded 17 drops. We try to not overemphasize, you know, the drop balls, and we, we know it's there. We, we're not, you know, uh, numb to it, but the one thing we have to do is uh, keep moving forward. We're going to clean it up. We've seen what this Penn State team can do as James Franklin credits them with winning the explosive plays battle most every week. If they can make those explosive plays, they could be in line for a big bounce back victory against Michigan State. Guys, back to you. All right, Josh. In fact, Penn State 43 explosive plays to 16 so far for the opponent this year. And that's going to be important. And again, if they can get a running game in this game, that changes the dynamics. Oh, there's no question. It opens some play action things and it opens them. You know, you're going to force them to put more people around the ball, which gets you more one on one matchups outside, which you, which you got to win. Look, we're going to talk about Michigan State a little bit more, but the fact remains this has been a really disappointing start to yeah. the season for Michigan State. Yeah. They had a lot of starters coming back. This was a team ranked in the top 14 in the country. They're 3-2, and two, and they're facing the meat of their schedule now. Steve, you mentioned it. They haven't even faced the tough opponents quite yet, yeah. and that's part of the reason why their rushing defense is so good. We'll see. I mean, Penn State's bringing a lot better rushing attack than they've seen the rest of the year, but that fan base has to be really disappointed with 3-2. and two. They're going to hit the meat of their schedule with Penn State, Michigan, Purdue, at Ohio State. This is a team that could be fighting for a bowl bid if they don't get their act together. All right. Well, they're going to fight in Beaver Stadium on Saturday. We're going to flip the script now. We're going to take a look at, obviously, the Penn State defense and the Michigan State offense after this. You know, in the previous segment, we took the hidden numbers that Todd found, and we were able to break it down. Todd then said, you know, let's look at some of the defensive numbers. I said, okay. So let's see what Todd <laughs> found as we go into the magic box. I'll tell you, Jay, this guy works hard. Look yes, at he those, does. Look at those numbers. I mean, the, uh, the sacks per game thing is the red zone 9 of 13. We go back to the red zone part again before, and, you know, I think it's six touchdowns. They've yeah. given up in the red zone. Again, that's what you're looking for. That field tightens up. You make plays. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, it, it amounts to points. Just have more points on the scoreboard, yeah. right? And so yeah. if you can trade touchdowns with field goals, you're going to have success. I think that's probably going to be one of the things that you look forward to this game as well. To Lewerke and the offense will probably move the ball. There was 800 yards, of 800 passing yards between these two teams <laughs> yes. last year. So they're going to move yeah. the ball in between the 20s in, in the midfield. It's what happens once you hit the red zone. And we've already documented that Penn State sticks it in the end zone, and we'll see what, what Michigan State does. When yeah, I think that, that's a big part of it, too. I think they've done a better job in third down. Ohio State was 4 of 17 on third yep. down. Now, we know Penn State was 3 of 17, but Ohio State was 4 of 17 on third down. 
No question. And look, those are the situations that make a difference in the game. Yeah. Um, getting off the field on third downs is, is going to be a big key, especially for this game, because Michigan State can throw the football, and they've had some success, and, and you want to make sure your offense is on the field throwing the ball against Michigan State's and, defense. And getting off the field quickly. They had a lot of three and outs yeah. against one of the top offenses in the entire country with Ohio State. And pressure does make a difference. We pointed out in the show two weeks ago that the number within the number for Dwayne Haskins was, in a limited sample size, 42% when pressured. And it showed up in that game. Brian Lewerke is a 67% passer. But when pressured, he's 47% and a bigger sample size to show that as well. So that's going to be one of the keys moving forward. All right, so now let's get to our Blaze Alexander players to watch in the second half of the season. Brought to you by Blaze Alexander Family Dealerships. All right, so Todd went first last time. I vote Jay going first okay. this time. I'm going to go for Jan Johnson and the entire linebacking core because I think that's going to be the key to this defense the rest of the way. The next five weeks, you're looking at Michigan State likes to power run, play action, throw the ball. Um, you look at uh, Iowa, you look at Wisconsin, you look at Michigan. They're going to be challenging the next several weeks. I'm looking at the corners, John Reed and Omani Oruarie. I think these guys are going to have some tough matchups as they get into the Big Ten schedule. They're going to have to do a great job covering, allow the defensive line to get to the quarterbacks. You mentioned the numbers, Steve, when a quarterback is pressured are a lot worse. I think if the corners can stick with their men and, and cover them and do a good job there, I think it, it helps out the rest of the defense. I'm going to look at depth of defensive tackle. I think that's going to be one. I think Givens and Windsor are two really solid starters. Givens can be spectacular at times. Can you give them enough rest during the course of the game where you don't have a drop-off, where you can keep things stable and they come back fresh and able to give, give you that kind of performance that you need? So I think I'm going to look at that in the second half of the season. All right, so now you got Michigan State offensively. Lewerke moves. I mean, he does move, and that makes a big difference, Todd, because he creates something out of nothing. I mean, I always talk about sports are more ad-lib than people realize. You yeah. can call all the plays oh, you no want. Oh, no question. Yep. Okay? And people don't you know, Everybody talks about feel for the game and it factor. That's what it is. When you're ad-libbing and it's breaking down, you make, you make something happen. Well, as Penn State fans and as people that watch Penn State, what – frustrates the defense the most. And what happened in the Ohio State game? Trace McSorley tucking it under and yeah. running for all those big yards. Lewerke can do the same thing, but in kind of Trace's way, he also keeps his eyes looking down the yeah. field. He threw it 56 times last year, 33 of 56, I believe, for about 400 yards. So the, the guy knows what he's doing when it comes to a passing offense, can buy that time, and can also tuck it under and run if he needs to. He's going to need to make superior decisions, yeah. though, in this yep. game for four quarters because Look. they're going to have a hard time running the ball probably. Look, that was only eight State. attempts per hour. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's say a look at the tail of the tape, Jay, and then we'll get your, your thoughts on that. And you can see what they've done. Offensively, 27 points a game. You can see what they've done rushing-wise, and they've had to lean on Lewerke with that number right there. No question. And, you know, the, the, one of the keys for Michigan State is if they can get the ball, if they can move the ball at least a, fairly effectively. They don't have to kick, kill it. They don't have, it doesn't have to be the lead thing, but they like to play action stuff off it so much yeah. that uh, it's key. They're going to have to at least have that threat for Penn State's defense. Well, when you look at what Michigan State's done, Scott's been out since uh, the end of the Arizona State game, so he might play this week. Then Hayward and Jefferson. Cam Brown is very direct. He says, look, take away the run, make them one-dimensional. It'll increase Penn State's chances of winning. We're always trying to stop the run, first of all. And if we can stop the run early in the game, we know that our D-line can put pressure on the quarterback, and we're going to have to make the quarterback make the hard throws. And that's one of the keys, make him make the hard throws, because he's got great targets to throw to. Yep. I mean, great target. Felton Davis really hurt Penn State last Big year. Big guys, too, and that's why I was mentioning yep. about the corners. These are tough guys to cover, and Lewerke, if he throws it in the right spot on the top shelf, they can go up and get it in big situations when it's, on, when it's third down. And one of the things we haven't really touched on too much is just, they've really been decimated by injuries. Yeah. We were oh, talking about this. Crushed. I mean, if you got L.J. Scott toting the ball back there, yeah. a big back that can get two, three, four yards, some of them on his own, it's a very, very different team. And, and you know, we, a lot of starters back, Jay, but a lot of them aren't there on the field now. No, and, and you know, of their top five wideouts, four of them missed significant yeah. time with injuries. And how many of those guys and the other guys play? They had a couple freshmen start to play that – have ability, but we'll yeah. see. But the one thing about D'Antonio, 
The guy is nine and five <laughs> against top ten teams in his career at Michigan yeah. State, and you know don't underestimate yep. this group coming in and their resolve. No, he no, he's done a good yeah. job. They are a talented team, and we'll talk about that talented team in just a few moments. We're going to zero in on Michigan State, what they've done to this point, what they haven't done to this point, and we'll break that all down for you in just a few moments as we continue with the blue white tailgate. Steve, Jay, Todd, and Josh. After this. All right, uh, welcome back. We're going to take a look at Michigan State now. When you look at Michigan State, I was not surprised when we were doing the picks. I wasn't surprised about the Arizona State thing because look, because it's 107 degrees at kickoff. You know, are you going to make it in the fourth quarter? It's not. It's not easy. Last week with Northwestern, they were at home, didn't win the game, so they, they still are in that up and down mode, and you're going to wonder how, quote, up they are this week <laughs> because they're yeah, up and down, and yeah, if we'll they're trade. up, up, yeah. up, it's, it's a problem. But, I mean, they've, they have struggled, and injuries are a huge reason yeah. why. There's no getting around. They've yeah. lost both their starting guards, meaning that their tailback's been out. Best corner. I mean, just yeah. Top corner's been out. It's, wide out's been out. Well, it's funny. It's one of those things that, you you know, look, you don't want them to lose all their games coming to you. You want them to come to Beaver Stadium as a ranked team so that if you do beat them it looks really impressive but some they've already been knocked out of the top 25 and that's a you know that's a factor of what they've been happening with the injuries and Jay you made a great point though about coach D'Antoni as we're going to start talking about him and you know he just always seems to ruin people's seasons oh, you know yeah. he comes up even if he's got a team that's like he's he's 67 percent win percentage I think yeah. in his career maybe close to 70 with Michigan State but some of the wins that he has are just big, big wins. He's ruined a lot <laughs> yeah, of stuff. Yeah, I was on the receiving right? end of yeah. a couple yeah. of those yeah. those big wins. <laughs> but you know, he's, he, you know, I think he. They are so detail oriented and so they put so much into preparation that it's surprising when they lose to a team like Northwestern. But you always worry yeah. about what's the bounce back. Oh. Well, remember a couple of years ago, they don't have Connor Cook. They go into Ohio State, yeah. win the game, yeah. right? With Tyler O'Connor at quarterback. And he threw for 65 yards, but there were 65 really good ones. <laughs> and, you know, and they won the game like 13 to 7, yeah. something like that. They, they do that because they're well prepared. And he's got a really good feel for his yeah. personnel at whatever time of the season it is. Some coaches can't adjust to the injuries and that type of stuff, but Coach D'Antonio always seems to adjust to what he's got, what yep. he's bringing to your stadium, what he's got to put out on the field. So expect just about everything. He knows where they're at. They're 3 and 2, they got to get a win. A road win would save their season at Penn State. Trick plays, double reverses, whatever, oh, yeah. fake field goals, they need to be prepared for just about yeah. anything. All right. You also have to be prepared for a good middle linebacker, Joe Bocci, who's played really well this year. Cam Brown, linebacker to linebacker, he's impressed by the guy. He, he plays aggressive. He, he's one of those, those, grit, those gritty linebackers that come downhill and hit you hard. And I feel like he plays he plays sideline to sideline well for his size. Uh, I mean, he's a he's a heck of a player. He played well last year too, and I I saw that, and I kind of was like, okay. I mean, I've always watched Michigan State's linebackers just because of the, uh, I just like the, the the way they played, the finesse they played with. Yeah, he is a tough guy in the middle. Joe Bocci's a good player. Then Kenny Willickis gives them pressure off the outside. Yep. He's he already has eight tackles for losses this year. And there's another there's a guy who walked on to Michigan State and yeah. has worked his way into just being a really really good player. A unbelievable motor on that kid never stops moving about four sacks and I think that tackle for loss is a statistic that's going to be important for Penn State because yeah. you remember when uh, Miles Sanders had 200 yards rushing right. and had zero negative runs right. in yeah. that game and so they want to establish the run to maybe to set up the, the pass yeah. we're talking about the number one rushing defense in the country so if you can keep your runs even if they're not negative runs and you're not gaining six seven yards but you're keeping it still in good down and distance situations. That could be important. Justin Lane good at the corner. Then Kari Willis has two interceptions at that safety spot this year. Now we go to the offense. All right. And for James Franklin, when he looks at Brian Lewerke, the movement, the ability to make plays out of the pocket, both with his arm and with his feet, he says, look, you got to keep them confined. With their quarterback, I think the biggest thing is, is make him hold on to the ball. Um, and, and try to keep them in the pocket. You know, uh, obviously our contain rushers and things like that cannot, cannot allow them to break contain and get on the perimeter where now he can hurt you by running the ball or now our defensive backs have to cover uh, for an extended period of time, which is always challenging. That is going to be big. Somehow keeping him in the confines of that pocket so he's not creating on the fly because at times he has been their top runner. 
Right, and the other thing, Steve, you talked about earlier, the defense, Penn State's defensive tackle staying fresh. You know, you can do everything you want with contain, but you've got to get some push yeah. in the middle because now his ability to see down the field and throw is going to be critical because he can stay in the pocket and make the big throws. He can make the out cuts. He can throw those. those he's got the whole arsenal. And, Todd, I know you really like Felton Davis as a wide receiver. No doubt about it. I mean, he's a, anytime you've got a matchup problem that's, you know, with a guy <laughs> that big, and, Jay, you alluded to Jawan Johnson. That's the kind of receiver you want Jawan Johnson to be on a week-to-week -week yeah. basis, right, as a, as a matchup nightmare for a corner. So, Look, it's, it comes down to the usual things, right? You're going to give up some yards. Do you stiffen in your red zone? Do you keep them out of the end zone? And what do you do on third downs? You know, how do you get them off the field? And, you know, if they can't run the ball, then we just talked about down and distance situations for Penn State's offense. Same thing when you flip it on the other side. You want to keep Lewerke and those guys to third and eights, third and sevens, so that if he does get pushed out of the pocket, he's not picking up that first down so easily. Yeah, and Daryl Stewart's back in the lineup, so that helps. It gives him another body out there. Cam Chambers is coming off an 82-yard performance against Northwestern, so he got back into the swing of it. But a giveaway takeaway thing is going to be a big part of this game, too. I think that, you know, that's, a, that's going to be a momentum thing for both teams. Yeah, well, no question. And Penn, State, Penn yeah. State's plus one or two this plus year, one. and Michigan State's about even. Yeah. So that, yeah. that could go either way. You talk about, too, I think their spirit. You know, this is a team that if you get on top of them early, you might be able to break their spirit yeah. a little bit, too, yeah. because their season hasn't went the way that it wanted to. And they know this is going to be a tough road trip yeah. at Beaver Stadium. So if you have a good first half, I don't know, you, you might be able to stay on top of this team. All right, so we're going to take a trip to the film room. This week, Jay takes a look at Casablanca. He'll break it down. Oh, I'm sorry, no, you, no, wrong film. Uh, saving Private Ryan. Oh, good. I like that movie. That was very good. <laughs> was nice. no, well done. Yeah. Jay in the film room with Todd in just a few moments as we continue after this. We are back on the Blue White Tailgate. We're into the film room. It's brought to you by Beer Belly's Beverage. Jay, I'm not going to say much during this segment other than to say you have stepped up your wardrobe game this episode. Outstanding homecoming sweater. Got the homecoming sweater going. Homecoming's a big deal. Yeah. I love homecoming. Yeah. Unbelievable. And they got a good opponent for it. And Absolutely. you've taken a good look at the Spartans. What'd you yeah. find? Uh, a lot of things to be concerned about. A lot of things you got to look at. And let's start with defense because that's where they start first. And they want to stop the run, and that's going to be a challenge. So let's talk about how you take advantage of what they do and take a look here. Again, as, as Michigan State's been doing since D'Antonio was there, they're going to pressure your outside receivers with their corners. They're going to play with three linebackers, take away the run. What that's going to open up for is some pass game with the, with the running backs. If Penn State can get Miles Sanders involved in the, in the pass game, it's going to help them out. Let's take a look at what Indiana did here. They motion them out, and you see they make an adjustment. All of a sudden, you've got a linebacker running with the, with the tailback, and he's not good enough to cover him. Unfortunately, they couldn't make the throw. Hopefully, Trace McSorley will make that throw given that opportunity. Again, if, whether they're in the nickel or whether it's a linebacker out here, these guys are going to be involved in the run game. They're going to try and make this a game where everything gets funneled back into these guys. So when you look at the run game, he's coming. He's coming downhill. Take a look at, at what they do here. Again, they're going to try and turn everything back into the linebacker. So here again, they come up. Both those guys pressure. Keep outside leverage in the linebacker. A guy, Joe Bocci, whose name you're going to hear a lot on Saturday, you, he, he's going to make a lot of plays. That's just the way they are. Now, when they get you to – when, when one of the things that Indiana did and Penn State may do because they do have the same formation, they bunch you up in here. Once they bunch you up, these corners can't press because they have to worry about switches and crossing routes. And one of the things that they like to do is, is bunch these guys up and make, make these guys make plays. Now, the key for them is going to be getting pressure with four guys against Penn State. And take a look at how they do that against Indiana. Even though they're not pressed, they make a good adjustment. They get there, they get pressure, they make a bad throw, and there's a pick six. And those are the kind of things that Michigan State is going to rely on trying to make those plays to keep them in the game or get them ahead in the game. Now, when you get to their, when you get to their uh, blitz package, one of the things that's unusual about them is when they blitz, they don't always play man. They'll play three deep with three underneath, which opens up the uh, pass game in certain areas of the field. They'll, this guy's going to bail the three deep. They're going to bring him. Now, the quarterback has got to be able to recognize that and react and throw. And Indiana's quarterback does a nice job on this one, seeing the blitz coming. Notices the blitz, gets back to pass, throws it out there, and there's the open area. And a guy like Trace McSorley, with his experience, will be able to take advantage of those things. And then when you get the third down, they have a speed package that they like. They bring two linebackers on the outside. They got a defensive end on the inside. And then a defensive tackle is going to push the pocket back. But notice when we look at the film how quickly these guys get up the field. And you'll see it on the film here. 
They really come up the field, put a lot of pressure on your offensive tackles, and then they get pressure in the middle and force the bad throw. Okay, so that's the defense. You look at the offense and the guys that you thought you might be looking at, you're not necessarily looking at this part of the season because they got some new faces in there. Yeah, let's take a look. They, they, you look at they had 10 starters coming back. Five of the tar- starters were coming back and missed time. Three of the top four wideouts have been hurt. So they've really got to adjust. They've had to adjust. It really is a mass unit. But let's take a look at some of the things Penn State's going to have to take care of. One of the things is the power run game. Now, they have struggled with the run game. They may get their tailback Scott back. But, again, they're going to move the pile here. They're going to come kick things out and bring a tight end that's not in the shot around to, to come up and, uh, and block on the linebacker. So take a look at this from the, from the end zone shot here. You're going to see they kick out wide hole. Now, the thing that's different this year is they're not getting the extra yards. A uh, guy like Scott last year, when he would get to this safety, he'd get you another seven or eight or ten yards or make a miss and get you a 20-yarder. They're not getting those kind of run plays this year like they have in the past. Play-action passes are going to be a key for Penn State. Now, they get in this bunch set. The key is how are they going to play Felton Davis? Felton Davis is one of the best wideouts in the country. So if they play him one-on-one, expect a lot of passes to him. If not, that's going to leave the front side open for some of the play action. Now here, take a look what they do with the play action fake to the back and him coming around. They fake a reverse, and now they come off that thing. The tight end who had blocked now sneaks out, and he's a big, tall guy. They do not throw the ball to tight ends a lot, but Penn State's got to be ready for it. We talked about Felton Davis, but can Michigan State's other wide receivers beat Penn State in the slot and on the outside? That's going to be a key, but take a look at how good this guy is. Here he's going to run a corner route. The throw's thrown behind him, and he makes an unbelievable throw, a catch on this one. So take a look. This is the beauty of having a wideout like this. You put it in the neighborhood, he's going to go up there and grab the ball with one hand. And uh, like I said, this guy's got all kinds of talent. Reminds me a lot of Plaxico Burris, who was at Michigan State back in the late 1990s. Then when you get back to the last thing, they're going to try and get their wides because they have not gotten big plays of the running backs. They're going to try and get their wideouts involved in the run game to make big plays. Here they're going to run just a jet sweep. They bunch everybody down. They block everybody at the edge, and they get them on the outside and take a look at some of the speed they have with one of their freshman wideouts, hopefully, who may or may not play. But take a look at him take this thing around the edge. They've got speed. And last week, this guy didn't play because he was hurt, but Felton Davis took some of the reverses, and he had a 48-yard touchdown run. So they're getting big run plays out of the wideouts. So a lot of things to look at Saturday. It was a big year. It's supposed to be a big year for Michigan State. So you have empathy if you're a Penn State person and you say, well, imagine if half of our starting lineup was gone. You don't have sympathy for them. That's just the way that this game goes. You have a little empathy, but no sympathy. But they have some dangerous components that they're bringing to Beaver State. No question. And and look, if Felton Davis has a big day, if Lewerke has a big day, it could be much like last year where all of a sudden we walk out of there and we're surprised by the result. But, you know, I think Penn State holds on to the ball. They stay out of third and longs. They're going to be just fine. All right. I think you had a lot of fun in the film room, especially with the homecoming sweater That's on. That's right. The hunting pants. He's all ready to go. I'm all ready for we'll, fall. We'll finish up Blue White Tailgate coming up after this. <laughs> Welcome back to Blue White Tailgate, and now we have our Shop Talk segment sponsored by Ace Hardware of State College. I'm joined now by Frank Bodani of the York Daily Record. Frank, good to have you on. Hey, doing great, man. Just coming off a of bye week and a little little break from things, so we're ready to roll here. That's good. I mean, bye week provides rest for even the media, so it's good to be back covering Penn State football. It's something that you've been covering for for a long time. I mean, in, in those 25 years, you said, what's really been a highlight for you? The, some of the bigger wins at, at home with the atmosphere of the crowd, especially lately. Um, you know, I didn't go to Penn State, so I didn't grow up going to the games or being a student going to the games. So seeing the way that the crowd has, they've really brought the crowd together over the last 10 years or so, so that it really has become as intimidating of a place as it could have been. So, you know, the win two years ago against Ohio State, no one expected it, which brings that whole extra level of, wow, what did you just witness type of thing. Um, I think some of the really good moments with Joe Paterno when he won his 300th game, uh, Penn State probably had one of their best comebacks in 2001 when they beat Ohio State at home, uh, Joe passed Bear Bryant that day. That was pretty cool. Well, it's certainly an, an historic program. A lot of 
memorable moments, as you can see. This year, we've seen K.J. Hamler re create some memorable moments of his own. I mean, you, you wrote an article on how he's been a hero for Penn State so far this season. Can you elaborate on what he's meant to this team, specifically the offense? Yeah, and it's it's been absolutely necessary and needed because coming into the year, Penn State's receivers, I think, were definitely one of the strengths, thinking one of the strengths of the team. Um, so K.J. Hamler has stepped in as a redshirt freshman and has been the most reliable receiver, not just the best big play guy either. Um, you know, he made the, probably the toughest catch of the year against Appalachian State to send that game into overtime. And he's electrified people with a, a kind of uh, game speed and moves that I, I'm not sure we've seen at Penn State. Yeah, and he's he's made so many plays in the return game as well, and it, it's it's good to have a, a freshman like him who can really make an impact. And another one of those freshmen is Micah Parsons. You've written a lot about him this season. You know, lo local product. What what does he add to this defense, and and how has he impressed you with his play so far this year? I think he's been really consistent. I think you know, and I'm probably part to blame too. You know, as long as a lot of fans who expected Micah to come in and really make more game-changing type plays, using his athleticism to make more big plays, and he hasn't done that yet. But I think a lot of that is that it's not just that Mike is a true freshman. He's also trying to learn how to play linebacker on the spot. He's trying to be acclimated to a new system, college, um, the Big Ten, and a new position all at the same time. So when you take all that into account, you know, he's still one of the tackle leaders on the team. What I'd be looking for in the second half from him, you know, the, as he gets more comfortable, you kind of want to see some of those big plays start coming, the pass rushing plays, the sacks, the pressures, maybe some turnovers. It's, it's good to see that Penn State has the guys to, to make those, but as you said, it's, it's nearing the halfway point on the season. What other guys really jump out to you on this Nittany Lion team? Um, tight end Pat Fryermuth has been better than I expected. Tight end was a big question for Penn State coming into the season. He's quickly shown that not only can he handle blocking well enough as a true freshman, which I think has got to be really tough for that position physically, but he's been a great receiver. And you can see Trace developing more of a connection with him each game that he relies on him. He trusts, him. <clears throat> he trusts Pat now, you know, and he had – a great, a great game, a great second half against Ohio State, and you know, almost a much better game. I mean, it was a great fourth down and one call in the first half, where they tried to throw him a tight end screen, and Ohio State's uh, defensive lineman just made a great play on it. Yeah, uh, that was the theme of a lot of the plays last week, but Firemuth did a great job. And now there's Michigan State to get ready for for Penn State. So any any final thoughts you have on this team and, and this game coming up? Yeah, I mean, it's huge bounce back for Penn State. Really good, I think, that considering the loss to Ohio State, no matter how it happened, they get a week off. They didn't get that last year after the tough loss to Ohio State. They do this year, and then they get to come back at home. And they're catching Michigan State at a time that's different than last year, too. I mean, Michigan State has a lot of ability, but they've really struggled of late. You can see that Brian Lewerke is still a really good quarterback, but it almost like he's trying to do too much because the offense around him is not living up to uh, its preseason expectations. I don't think the offensive line has been real great for him. His receivers have not been as consistent as they were last year. And he's being put in a tough situation trying to run a pro-style offense. And Michigan State has not made the plays to win games in the second half as people expected. So I think it's a really good chance for Penn State's um, offense in particular to, to get back on track, especially the pass game. It's definitely a huge game, and we'll talk about it more on Blue-White Tailgate coming up. And, Frank, thank you so much for your time. We've got more Blue-White Tailgate for you after this. Right over the last few years, 
we've always been on before homecoming, so are we part of the tradition? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this show is a tradition like any other. Has That's that right. been used before? Yeah, a little bit. It may yeah, have been. It rings I, familiar, right. yes. All right. A lot of traditions at Penn State, and every once in a while you want to introduce a new one. This time they're going to send one of the buses in, the lead bus, with Letterman as part of homecoming. What do you think of that, Letterman? Uh, you really, I'll shoot it to you straight. Um, I don't like it. Only because I feel like it's the player's time. Let them have that moment. You know, we didn't want anybody else around when we got in those buses. and that, you know, But you know what, it's, it's a different time and let's see, we'll see how it goes. Yep, they're testing out different stuff. They, you know, they want to try different things for homecoming and uh, you know, we'll see who makes it on the bus. I mean, I think the interesting part about it is he said, once the bus is full, the, the bus is full. So we'll see which lettermen come out and hop on. Yeah, I think it's fun to try it. Let's yeah. see how it goes. Try it. You know, see how it goes. It'll be great. In the end, it's still about the game. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've now hit the point of the show, which is uh, said by both of our cards and letters to be the most popular one, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I get the good this week. How about that? The good is homecoming. Homecoming is just a great tradition on any campus, right? Well, it's not traditional homecoming garb you're wearing. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes, it is. <laughs> Come it's, on. This is autumnal splendor. Where's That's the right. raccoon coat? The <laughs> I'm <minute>? autumnal. <laughs> Come on. What's going on? But I think it's great with the parade and the guarding the lion shrine and everything. I think it's just fun and, let, you know, everybody let loose. I can't believe I would actually look at you, Sadowski, and say, the bad. The bad. Oh, I'm a bad you're, guy. You're Absolutely. a bad man. Bad seed, bad seed. <laughs> Autumnal splendor, is that what I heard, by the yes, way? Yes, autumnal, autumnal splendor. Splendor, okay. I'll Autorial leave that one splendor. alone. That's right. <laughs> uh, the bad. How about the defense in the Red River showdown? I mean, I was an entertaining game. It was fantastic. But apparently, Oklahoma's coaching staff from Lincoln Rally was not enamored with the defense, so much so that Bob Stoops is now gone. Uh, out of a job, or Mike Stoops. I, Mike, I can't, Mike, Mike, Mike Stoops. Stoops. I can't yeah. keep track of the They're Stoopses. both out of a job right now. They're yeah. both out of Oklahoma. But they got rid of their defensive coordinator after losing to a rival in Texas, 48-45. So that's never a good sign when you're trying to get in the college football playoff and you lose and you get rid of your defensive coordinator midseason. My ugly Odell Beckham Jr., shut your <laughs> mouth. And here's why. Uh, you know, two years ago at the end of the season, you were heading into the playoffs, and you and a bunch of buddies decided to take your day off and fly to Miami and celebrate in a boat. You know what the Giants' record is since then? Four and 14, okay? Focus on those things. I would, you know, there's not a wideout in the league that's worth those kind of headaches. Quite frankly, you can be replaced. And, by the way, Eli was not the one that let the ball hit his leg, Odell that led to a Carolina touchdown. All right, picks. All right, right out of the gate, Colorado, USC. Josh, give us a full, complete breakdown. USC is going to have a tough time dealing with LaVisca Chenault, who the Buffs seem to line up all around the field and has made big plays all season long. In addition, Colorado already has experience this season going into a hostile environment and coming home with the W. I expect that to happen again as the Buffs are going to take out a road win in their second away game this season. Steve, who do you got? All right, well, I've got Baylor in Texas. I'm not going to go into a long analysis like you did, Josh. <laughs> Texas is going to crush this team like a grape. <laughs> hey, 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 <laughs> Matt Rule, State College native, head coach of Baylor. Give him a shot. Not so fast, my friend. No, <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got Washington, Oregon, Tom. I got Washington and Oregon, and here's what I've done. My picks have been so bad that I'm not going to pick who I think is going to win. I'm going to pick who I want to win, do and maybe that'll help. Do the opposite, I'm Costanza. going to do the opposite. I'm going to go with Oregon over Washington uh, because I want Penn State to continue to work their way up by not even playing, right? They've moved up three spots yeah. in a bye week because all these teams in front of them lose. Washington uh, may lose to Oregon. We'll see. We'll see if the Ducks can do it. Well, I've got Wisconsin and Michigan, and when they announced that game day was going there, I, there were a number of tweets just to simply said, Why? Now, that said, I think this is a big game for the Big Ten. I think it's important. Um, if if I got to pick this one, which I do, I'm going to go with Michigan. They're at home, and they're throwing the ball a little bit better than Wisconsin. Not so fast, my friend. No. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get even. That's right. All right, you know. All right, keys to the game. Look, I think the giveaway takeaway part, and the keys are brought to you by our great friends at Aaron's. I love these chairs, man. Uh, I think. Giveaway takeaway is huge in this game. I think that fast change and who can handle it and stay away from it is going to be really big. All right, Jay? I think, you know, we talked about in the film room, Penn State staying on schedule, staying yeah. out of third and longs because 
Michigan State is going to give you a lot of things on third down, so give you problems. I think they need to continue what they've been doing all year long, and that's to finish drives. To finish drives with touchdowns against Michigan State, get on top of this team earlier. I don't think there's any hangover concerns, but I don't think you want to be in a real, real tight ball game down the stretch again. Well, for everyone at home, we want to give you a lot of credit. If you did not sit there and attempt to adjust the color on your set during the course of this, we appreciate that. <laughs> for Jay Todd, Josh, I'm Steve. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>